Just leave on two, clear take off, left hand. Take off left, it is speed one. Clear left, speed west, copy. Hello and welcome to the Blue Skies Podcast. I'm PR Ganapati, your host. Welcome back to the program. We have a Marshal Philip Rajkumar with us again. A Marshal Rajkumar, as uh, you remember from uh, episode three of the Blue Skies, participated in the attack on Sargoda. And at the end of that episode, he spoke about being detailed for the test pilot school at Epner in France. And so we'll pick up the threads from there. Welcome back to the program, sir. Thank you, Gans. Good to be back. So, sir, as you uh, as we'd mentioned, you were uh, just beginning to, you know, you'd enrolled in a three-month course of French uh, to go to Epner. Uh, we've heard of ETPS, we've heard of uh, Edwards Air Force Base. Tell us a little bit about Epner and uh, your experiences when you landed up there. Epner stands for the Ecole du Personnel Navigant SA, the reception, which in French means French fl flight test school, French school for flight test personnel dealing with both experimental and production testing. They run courses for test pilots, both fixed wing and rotary wing, and flight test engineers, fixed wing and rotary wing, and a third category of test crew called instrumentation engineers. Mm -hmm. So the training was conducted in teams, which are called equips, and it was always a pilot, an engineer, and an instrumentation engineer who formed the team and went through the course. So the course started on the 8th of October, 1971, and my government of India letter for Sudhir and myself authorized us to stay ex-India for 275 days, which is a little over nine months, because India was, as you know, in October 71, was going through a huge foreign exchange crisis. The Bangladesh war was looming. And there was a lot of financial distress. So anyway, we went, we landed up uh, at Epner one day late and we were ushered into the commandant's office. Both of us were in our tunics and pea caps and log books in our hand. And the commandant gave us a welcome speech in French and Sudhir and I stood with a silly grin on our face because we didn't know what he was saying. And fortunately, the chief um, instructor was Mr. Van Acker, who had done his course in ETPS, uh, UK, and he spoke English. So he said, I am sure you gentlemen didn't understand what the commandant has said. We said, you bet we didn't understand anything. So he said, come with me, and he took us to his office. And he said, I understand your predicament because I was in the same boat in the UK. But unfortunately, the instruction here is in French. and." Um, we have not called you here. Your government has sent you here. So we expect you to get up to speed in the language in the next 30 days. Otherwise, we are going to send you back. So that was a huge shock. So Sudhir and I went to the library, pulled out some old um, records, you know, a tape tapes of uh, French language conversation, and we sat with our with the earphones for hours together in the library whenever we had a little spare, spare time. And I started speaking in my broken French to whoever I came across. And they all laughed at me in the beginning. But then they realized that I was making a huge effort and they all became very cooperative. And at the end of 30 days, uh, we were able to 
manage. I mean, they didn't send us back. The, the second thing was I had no uh, twin engine flying experience at all. So they, they were very concerned that I wouldn't be able to cope with a twin engine. So my first eight sorties in FNR were only on uh, transport aircraft, uh, the Nord 260 and the Nord Atlas. The Nord Atlas is a twin engine, um, piston engine aircraft, which looks, it's a smaller version of a packet which we had. So this one month that you were, um, you know, learning a crash course in French, the course was also going on. So there was also a differential calculus and all of those complex technical yes. things. And uh, in the first one month in ground school, there were incidentally 400 hours of ground school. And uh, the ground subject classes used to run from 8.30 to 11.30, three hours. 11.30 to 12.30 was the lunch break. And 12.30 to 5.30 was flying. This was the standard right through the course. And uh, during the first um, four weeks, we ran through the entire uh, college uh, physics and maths um, syllabus, so to speak, a quick um, brush through algebra, calculus, a little bit of uh, thermodynamics, and so on. and. Uh, Every 15 days, we had a ground test. And the ground test was uh, sometimes written, sometimes oral. And then the flying was also going on. So it was a very uh, stressful time for us, at least, because we had to. And after flying, I had to come back and write a report, which was uh, immediately after the flight, we had to write a report. And I had to go back to the room and sit and late in the night, sit up late in the night and write the report in French and hand it in the next morning. Whereas my French course mates used to come back from the sortie and in 15, 20 minutes, they would scribble their report, hand it in and go off home. But I had to do the homework. So anyway, that carried on. We caught up with it. And uh, the interesting thing was the couple of days after we landed up, they gave us 16 pilot's notes, all in French, and uh, said, we expect you to be ready. We will give you two weeks notice that you will be flying a particular type of aircraft. We expect you to study the notes, go to the aircraft, familiarize yourself with the aircraft, and be ready because you will find your name on the flying program with a particular type. So the day I flew the Super Mister, I, in India, somebody would accompany you to the aircraft and help you strap up and see you off and all that. But there, I came back after lunch. I found my name on the flying program for the Super Minister. I walked to the aircraft. There was not a soul in sight. When I reached the aircraft, one gentleman in a bar cart drove up and uh, he connected the battery and he manned the fire extinguisher, helped me strap up. I started up and he pulled out the chocks and off I went. Wow. This was very uh, something I wasn't used to, but it gave a lot of confidence. And the same thing happened with the other types which I flew, which was the Mirage 3B and uh, later on the Attendard 4M, the carrier-bound fighter, which we used. Um, we did three sorties on that for evaluation. So it was... Um, lot of confidence building and uh, very interesting because uh, we were flying over uh, the south of France, that is the Mediterranean Sea. The coastline along the Mediterranean Sea was the flying area and it was a very pretty place. So it was a great experience and gave us a lot of confidence, especially for me, because I hadn't flown transport aircraft, the asymmetric flying training which I got there was very, very good. And uh, I came back um, much better informed and uh, having better skills than what I had when I went. The, uh, the Did they have a variable geometry aircraft and things like that? Yeah. Um, can you imagine back in 1972, they were already flying a variable not variable geometry, but variable stability, Mirage 3. Hmm, variable stability, sorry. Hmm. 
Variable Stability Mirage 3 with an analog fly-by-wire system, which uh, later on uh, in uh, it was the end of the 1970s, in 1980, they flew the Mirage 2000, which just goes to show the amount of preparatory work that has to be done before you launch a program. So I'll come to that later when we speak about the Tejas. So I flew the variable stability Mirage 2, two sorties, and they showed us all the various uh, stability problems that one is likely to encounter. And uh, so that was a great learning experience. Another great experience was in the aircraft called the Nord 260, 262, which is a 28-seater turboprop. There was an engineer, flight test engineer, come test pilot called Klopstein. Now, Klopstein was a man who felt that you could use the head-up display to land in any kind of poor visibility conditions. And he had being a flight test engineer himself and a test pilot, he himself had designed the whole system. So as you came in blind, absolutely blind, you got a miniature runway appear on your head-up display, which, if the inertial platform was accurate, overlaid the natural runway. And you could just go in and land. So now the Klopstein window is quite... Uh, quite a common thing in the head-up displays of commercial aircraft. Uh, I don't know which are the commercial airplanes which use these, but I know it is in current use. But Klopstein passed away in uh, 2006 as quite an unsung hero. Uh, then, the towards the end of the course, we went on various visits. I, we went to the Italian flight test center, Pratika di Mare, near Rome, and I flew the Mackie 326 uh, trainer there. And uh, good trainer did, did some spins, and uh, it was a very nice sortie flying over the Italian, over the uh, Italian coast. Then we went into the evaluation phase where we had to fly three hours on three different types of aircraft, the Mystia 20, which later became the Falcon 20, the uh, Etendard 4M uh, carrier bone fighter, and the Transal. The Transal was a twin turboprop, large transport airplane of the AN32 class, no, not AN32, AN12 class. AN12. Yeah, it was a 48 ton all up weight. And uh, on these aeroplanes, of course, the Etendard 4M didn't have a trainer, so we just jumped into it and flew it. We had to practice uh, carrier approaches and uh, simulated carrier landings at, on a ground-based facility at a place called Neem, which was about uh, 40 miles from East Ridge. <laughs> then in all these aircraft, uh, we were just sent off in the Mystia 20. I did a cross country from Istres to Corsica just to evaluate its um, use as an executive jet, how comfortable it was, how, how easy it was to fly, and the other characteristics. And we had to write an evaluation report, all in French, mind you. Then the Transal, which is such a big uh, transport airplane, we were just given one hour, 30 minutes duel. And then the next time I found myself sitting in the left seat with Sudhir on the right seat and a French uh, oh engineer in the jump seat. So all this was a great experience and uh, gave us a lot of confidence. Finally, in uh, July, at the end of the course, I had to go to Brittany, which is just outside Paris to the CEV headquarters for the final test, final flying test. And the final flying test was conducted by uh, Colonel Kanak, who was the boss of uh, the center. And he had done his course at ETPS with uh, Vinkwanda Chopra, who later became chairman of chair. So he, he did ask me how Chopi was doing and so on. My final test was flown on a caravel. You know, the caravel, the uh, 98 seater with two rear mounted engines. 
So the Colonel Kanak gave me a test order. He says this aircraft has undergone this all these modifications. I want to see what kind of tests you plan and how you execute it. I'm a second pilot for you. I don't know anything about the aircraft. You have to guide me. And there will be an engineer in the jump seat. You will have to make use of his services also. And one of the things we look for is crew resource management. How you manage your test crew. Uh -huh. So I have never sat in a caravel before. So a quick familiarization of the instrument panel and with help from the flight test uh, flight engineer. We started up and went off and flew and I took it through the test order which I had made. I made, can I call out the various parameters that I was asking him to jot down. Then I made the flight engineer do some work. And uh, then we came back, we fed into an ILS and came back and landed. And uh, uh, he said, go around. As we were going around, he pulled back one engine. And uh, wow. so now I had a single engine, so I had to call out the engine failure a checklist to the flight, uh, flight engineer to carry out. And I uh, asked the uh, Kanak to check for the fire warning indications and so on. Anyway, I did a single engine circuit and uh, landing. And uh, came back in the debrief, he said, uh, you managed the, your crew resource management was good. And uh, I'm happy with your performance. I heaved a huge sigh of relief and <laughs> went back to Easter's. And at the end, of course, our interview with the commandant, he says, we were very worried when you came here because of your poor knowledge of French and the fact that you hadn't flown transport aircraft. But uh, I'm very happy to tell you that you performed well. And uh, we think you have all the qualities to make an excellent test pilot. So I almost fainted when I heard this. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> and I came back. Uh, in, in fact, I can take a photo shot of the end of course report, which of course is in French. And I, I can uh, send it to you and you can put it on. I'd love to see it in the podcast. Yeah. Now, uh, you had. Uh, grand told of maybe nine years of service at that point and uh, yeah I, I have just, this seems like a lot of uh, a lot of stuff you went through in that one year uh, as a very young pilot yes i was 30 years old with nine years of service in fact uh, for my ninth anniversary of my uh, commissioning uh, it came on a weekend and we had gone to Paris and I celebrated my ninth anniversary watching the Lido show in the Champs-Élysées. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. So Amazing. that way it was an extremely, um, what shall I say, stressful period, but also a huge learning experience. And I came back much better informed with, uh, with much better skill sets. Yeah. And so when you came back, you then spent what the next five, six years, I think, in test flying, right? Yeah, I came back in the middle of July and I reported to a and ATU in Kanpur. It was still the aircraft and armament testing unit. And the day I reported, the uh, group captain uh, Bargo, Kapil Bargo, put on my squad leader tapes. My promotion had come through, so I became a squad leader. But then I had to rush off on leave because I had some family problems to sort out. And I came back in September and uh, we concentrated. I concentrated on converting on to the Avro 748, the Marut, and the Hunter. Um, we had a Hunter on our establishment and I flew the Hunter 56 which was a beautiful aircraft. Then um, in early 73, in Jan 73, Kicha and I, Krishna Swami and I, I call him Kicha. So Kicha and I were sent off to Nasik to convert on to the Type 96, which is the new version of the MiG-21, MiG-21M, which was just entering service. 
So we went to H.A. Lozar, converted. And then the big trial which came up was the IMs, mid-21Ms which came into the IAF. Two squadrons were bought and they had an engine called the R-13 engine, which was more powerful than the R-11. After doing the Type 96 conversion, we came to know that uh, the two squadrons which were being bought in flyaway condition by the Air Force were coming with the R-13 engine, which is an improvement on the R-11, more powerful, and it had a second stage reheat which cut in about 1.3 Mach number. And in February, we had to do a comparative evaluation between one MiG-20 Type 96 with the R-11 engine and one fitted with the R-13 engine because we had to carry out an evaluation and decide which engine to fit on the 150 Type 96 which were planned to be built at Nasik. Aha, right. So, Kicha and I did a total of uh, 24 sorties, 12 each. And uh, we flew both. He flew some on the R11 and R13, and I did the same, some on the R11, R13. And uh, one of the interesting things which I had to do was uh, the static climbs to 19 kilometers. So I put on the pressure suit, and uh, sometime in early March, I did these climbs when the visibility was very poor and Kanpur only had a radio compass and non-directional beacon as a landing aid or a recovery aid. So the fat spine, you know, they put a dorsal tank on the spine of the aircraft, which has spoiled the area ruling, the beautiful area ruling of the Type 77. And the supersonic acceleration was uh, not had been badly affected. So to do the static climb, I had to accelerate to 1.85 Mach number and then pull the nose up. But the acceleration took a long time and ate up a lot of fuel. And I was reaching 19 kilometers with the 450 liter light glowing in the cockpit. And I would be about 150 kilometers away from base, and uh, then I had to throttle back and uh, descend slowly, conserve fuel, land up on circuit with 300 liters, and the third group pump light would come on and probably switch off with something like 200 liters in the aircraft. So those tests required a lot of planning and, uh, and had to be executed with care. Anyway, at the end of it, we said that uh, though the, there is small difference in performance, improvement in performance of the R-13 engine, and uh, decision on which engine to fit into the indigenous aircraft should be based on techno-economic considerations. And since the R-11 was already being made in Koraput, they decided to make the uh, R-11, I mean, the indigenous aircraft coming out of Nasik, they fitted it with the R-11 engine. We didn't go for the R-13. So this was in early 73. Then uh, those days, night attacks, to carry out attacks at night, we had to, they were using something called flare bombs. These flare bombs would be dropped by um, Canberra from a height of about uh, Three, three, three kilometers, and then as the flares were burning and drifting down, they created a uh, illuminated area over the target, and you could carry out your attacks. So uh, Kisha and I, uh, Kisha flew the Sukhoi seven, and I flew the MiG twenty one, and then uh, Thomas dropped a few of these. We were comparing the Lepus English flare with the Russian flare bombs. So we finished wow. that. And how long do these flares uh, take to descend? And how long is that window that you your target is illuminated? Um, they, we used to get something like um, three minutes, two and a half to three minutes of illumination. Wow. And uh, we could put in um, a fair number of attacks. 
And I remember Air Chief Marshal O.P. Mehra came to Jamnagar to see this. And uh, we, I fired a salvo, 32 57 millimeter rockets uh, at night. You know, that was some sight to see, you know. But uh, the illumination of the target using flare bombs is. Uh, it's gone out of the window now because now you don't need less to see at night because of the infrared devices which we have. Right, right. Yeah, so that was, at that time it was considered important and we did this trial. Then we came back to Kanpur and uh, I had again to rush off to Jamnagar to carry out some other trials. Then uh, is. AST, by the time A and ATU had become AST in August of 1972, and AST was asked to move to Bangalore. Now, this was uh, uh, entirely a uh, move uh, thought up by Air Chief Marshal O.P. Mehra, who became the Chief of the Air Staff in March of 1973. And, uh, he, at that time, was wearing two hats. He was both the chairman of HL as well as chief of the Air Force. Oh, wow. So for about three or four months, he wore these two hats till a new HL chairman was uh, chosen. And during this time, he just ordered AST, which came under his control. He said, you move to HL, HL will give you land. And HL gave us land because he controlled HL as well. So <laughs> it was a very fortunate uh, turn of events. And, uh, where AST is housed today is all um, the land given by HL at that time. Uh, account of Gole, who was the commandant at that time, uh, came to Bangalore and did the first sighting board. And AST owes a lot to Account of Gole for his uh, for, foresight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then we, after coming to Bangalore uh, later in that year, in August of uh, 1973, I was sent to the then Soviet Union in a team headed by Air Marshal Halsey. And uh, the purpose of that team was to look at the Soviet offer of a deep penetration strike aircraft. The Indian Air Force was. Um, searching for a deep penetration strike aircraft. And uh, the IAF had already evaluated the Jaguar and the Mirage F1 and the Buccaneer. So we, I went there to Russia with the, to the Soviet Union, Moscow with the team. And we were shown an aircraft called the Sukhoi 22 which is a bigger aircraft than the Sukhoi 7 and the outer one third of the wing would sweep forward and back, could be swept forward and back. Now, I was taken to the aircraft and there was a young uh, Soviet Air Force captain who didn't know a word of English and I didn't know too much of Russian except a few technical terms. and. Uh, we had the most hilarious time for an hour, you know, he, he was trying to explain to me what he <laughs> meant. And we both laughed a lot, but in the end, we finally managed to understand what the other person was saying. And I, then I went around and got hold of the fuel consumption figures and I checked it out against the air staff requirement which we were carrying. And I found that the, it was only meeting about 40% of our requirement. So I went and told that to Air Marshal Malse, and he immediately told the Soviets that uh, this aircraft is of no use to us. Unless you show me something better, I'm going back. So this rush, the Soviets went into a huddle and they said, no, no, you wait on, wait. So we waited there for a week. And during this time, um, Air Marshal was invited by Avia Export, the commercial arm of uh, the Soviet aircraft industry, which sold commercial aircraft. And uh, we had a nice uh, lunch on top of the TV tower in Moscow, which has a revolving restaurant. And uh, 
we were shown the AN26. So the AN26, we said we'll evaluate it against the medium transport aircraft requirement when we get back. So I took all the particulars and we came back and did a paper evaluation and rejected it. Now, because we rejected the Sukhoi 22, the Soviets showed us the MiG-23. The first time they showed us the MiG-23 swing wing aircraft. And they said, we want to fly it. They said, no, no, you sign the contract first and then we'll let you fly it. <laughs> so that is the standard uh, Soviet response. So we came back. Then in uh, all this while I was studying for the staff college entrance exam and then on uh, January or February 1974 I appeared Kicha and I appeared for the staff college entrance exam and both of us qualified and uh, Kicha being senior then I come to goal and said we can't let both of you go because there are only three of you here and uh, so Kisha went in 1975 and I went in 1976. But uh, in 1974, the whole of 74, um, the important work we did was, you know, the IAF was very interested in fitting a nav attack system, mainly a navigation system, at least in the Hunters and the Canberras. The Hunter 56As had come in, which had these 230 gallon drop tanks, which gave it a lot of uh, range at low level. And uh, but using a map and stopwatch was, uh, you know, fast getting outmoded. We needed something better. So we tried out the Doppler twin gyro platform navigation systems on both the Hunter and Canberra. And uh, though it didn't go on the Hunter, we did equip a few Canberras with this Doppler Twin Zero platform system. Uh -huh. And it did uh, see service in the IAF. Then in uh, 1975, I again went to Russia in April 75. This is because uh, the Russians said uh, you didn't like the R-13 engine. We'll show you an improvement of the R-13 engine. It's called the R-13F, uh, which will improve supersonic acceleration at low level. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So your father, then Wing Commander Ramachandran, CO 28 Squadron, myself, and the technical officer Squadron Leader Madhav, we went to Russia to a place called. Krasnodar near the Black Sea. And then we flew this aircraft. They said, in this populated area, you can't go supersonic. You have to limit yourself to 1,000 kilometers per hour indicated airspeed. So Ramu sir and I did two sorties each at Krasnodar. We couldn't see any difference up to 1,000 kilometers per hour. Then they said, no, no, the real difference you will see is supersonic. So we said, let us go supersonic. They said, no, no, here you can't go supersonic. We'll tell you where to go. You go back to Moscow. So we went back to Moscow and waited for one month. Wow. <laughs> uh, and every morning, the three of us would march off to the embassy to the air attaché's office and uh, spent time there. At the end of one month, the Soviets came back with, they said, uh, where we allow foreigners, you can't go supersonic. And where we go supersonic, we don't allow foreigners. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we had to come back. There was some story about the cows will not give milk if you go supersonic in this area or something. Yeah, like that. <laughs> that, that's, that's our interpreter's joke. We said, why can't we go supersonic near the Black Sea? He said, no, no, our cows will stop giving milk, he said. <laughs> they, <laughs> then, um, so we came back to Delhi and rejected that engine, which was a good thing because then the Soviets offered us the MiG Biz with the R25 engine, which uh, the much better engine, and which was later on manufactured under license at Koraput. So 
when I came back to AST after this Russian trip, I was uh, shifted from the flight test squadron to the school. I, and Thomas changed places with me. He went from the school to the flight test squadron. And I conducted number four production test pilots course, which had um, Neelu Malik, who later became the vice chief, uh, Nitin Gupte, uh, Rakesh Sharma, the cosmonaut, Pauli Mehra, who retired as CNC SWAC. So a lot of good guys were there. And then um, in January 76, I went off to Staff College. After Staff College, I was posted back to ASP for a short while. And then I went to Pathan Court for my flight commander's tenure. Right. Now, during this period, um, during 76, 77 is when you all went and finally test flew the MiG-23, isn't it? And and that's when also my father flew the 25. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that was a little later. That was in 79. So I am talking about uh, late 77. I reported to uh, Pathan Court 3 Squadron for my flight commander's tenure. The CEO. What were they flying at that time? Type 77s. Aha, uh -huh, okay. And uh, we were three mixed squadrons in Pathan Court. Uh, and uh, the airspace was very, very limited, so we had to take turns. But a lot of flying going on. And, uh, later on, early 1978, I was sent to do the fighter combat leaders course at Jamnagar with TAC D. And uh, so I did that course, number 12, uh, FCL, came back in June. And uh, the signal promoting us to wing commander came. You know, it was the height of uh, HE Marshal Mulgaonkar's tenure. And uh, there were a lot of people who got superseded. But um, I was one of the fortunate few who made it. And I went and took over 108 squadron, which was a type 96 squadron based at Adampur in October of that year. And uh, one of the things, two things which I did in uh, three squadron when I was flight commander was that uh, the CO was the only one who was cleared to give night duel checks. Mm -hmm. And he was, so I said, sir, you please clear me. I will start doing the duel checks. So I got cleared and I started doing the night duels and uh, the other thing was for the year 1978 uh, three squadron got the flight safety trophy for carrying out 3000 hours of flying accident free flying oh wow so i was the flight commander that was a good uh, good feeling you were returning to squadrons after almost uh six, seven years yeah, yeah. in test flying. Um, you know, what was the mental shift that you had to make between the work that you'd been doing as a test pilot versus being back in the squadron? The, the biggest uh, shift is uh, one of the things that a fighter pilot needs is aggression. You've got to be aggressive, you know, you've got to have that killer instinct in you to complete the mission and face the enemy. Whereas in test flying, the emphasis is on caution. So mm. test flying, you've got to worry about safety all the time because uh, having an accident or incident while test flying seriously sets back programs. So you have this shift between aggressiveness in squadrons and operational squadrons to caution in testing tenures. So that, yes, that is a psychological ad adjustment you have to make. How easy or difficult did you find that? Um, in my case, I had spent uh, nine straight years in fighter squadron before going for the test pilot schools. So I didn't find that very difficult at all. Then in um, 1970, end of early 1979, in April 79 was when 
I was CEO of one of its squadron at Adampur. I was pulled out and sent to Russia along with uh, Group Captain Ramachandran as a member of Air Marshal Katri's uh, evaluation team. And, uh, we went there and we were shown a number of aircraft. One was the IL-76 uh, heavy transport. The other was the Mi-24 uh, armed helicopter. Then we were shown the MiG-23 MF the air defense version, then the MiG-23B and the ground attack version, and the MiG-25. Very productive trip. We bought all five. <laughs> yeah. Uh, eventually, when uh, Air Chief Marshal Katre was a CAS, all these airplanes were in service. So, uh, your father, uh, Group Captain Ramachandran, and I went off to Lugavaya, and we had to spend uh, almost 14 days there. 10 days of ground school, morning uh, 7, 7.30 to evening 7.30 almost, with just a break for lunch. And uh, there was no simulator, so we had to do cockpit familiarization on our own. And then uh, we flew six sorties each on the MF and BN. I flew the BN. And then... Uh, we came back and uh, the, both of the aircraft entered service based on our reports. Right. Now, you know, to make up your mind for a, to, on an aircraft in six sorties, what are the sorts of things you would do in those six sorties that would give you a complete picture that allows you to decide whether to recommend it or not? Yeah, so you have the airstaff requirement with you. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, sir. So, um, I don't think our audience knows what an air staff requirement is. So maybe this is a good time to ask you to yeah. just explain that. The air staff requirement is put out by the plans branch at air headquarters, which uh, lays down the requirements for any particular aircraft that the IAF is wishing to acquire. The performance parameters and the maintenance requirements and so on, all the requirements that have to be met in service are laid down in the form of a document. And uh, that is the Bible when you're carrying out an evaluation, that you carry that with you. And then you take the aircraft manuals and decide on spot checks, which is the performance envelope, which I'll do a spot check, like uh, maximum altitude, maximum speed, uh, maximum turn rate, uh, <clears throat> Then what are the navigation aids? What are the nav? What is the nav attack system like? What are the communication aids? What are the uh, electronic warfare equipment fitted, and so on. So those are the kind of things you look for. But basically, you cannot go through the full envelope of the aircraft. So you do spot checks of takeoff and landing performance against the charts and the manuals. And you do spot checks of performance in the flight envelope, mainly the high altitude, high speed, high G uh, portions of the envelope. Okay. So you're not likely to discover some of the nastier habits of an aircraft because, you know, you're only doing this um, spot checks, I guess. No, that's perhaps uh, too short a period to do that. And the other thing, important thing is uh, fuel consumption. You were about to check out the fuel consumption figures of the aircraft in uh, various regimes of uh, you know, dry power, max reheat, and so on. And also the armament carrying capability, how much can it carry, how far can it go, what is the radius of action. You calculate all those on the ground and see whether uh, it meets with uh, the requirement, the air staff requirements. Now, this air staff requirement, how detailed a document is this? Is this oh, it's, it's, uh, hundreds of pages, uh, it is quite, 20, 30 pages? Quite What's detailed, this? quite detailed. A lot of time goes into the preparation of an air staff requirement. There are, uh, the plans branch takes inputs from the ops directorate and the maintenance directorate and, uh, and the industry in case you're planning uh, license manufacture. HL is also brought in. And in some cases, the RDO is also brought in. And uh, a very detailed document is prepared with all these inputs. Lovely. And I think, you know, later you held that position as Director of Air Staff Requirements. And so we'll maybe speak about that a little more in detail a little later. 
Great. So just give us an example, this MiG-23 air staff requirement. You know, what were the broad requirements? This was for a close air support, deep penetration strike. What was the May headline requirement for this aircraft? The um, MiG-23BN, which I evaluated, the requirement was to, it was, it was supposed to carry um, two tons of bombs over um, 300 nautical miles. That, that was the principal requirement. But uh, the MiG-23 BN could carry six tons of bombs. But it didn't go as far. It didn't go 300 nautical miles. It probably went as much uh, somewhere around 240, 250 nautical miles. So it was also swing wing. And it had one big drawback in the sense that to go the maximum range to get you the maximum radius for action it had to carry these 800 liter tanks under the wing and when the tanks were carried you couldn't sweep the wings back oh boy oh, 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 oh okay perform an operation mission you got to, you had to sweep the wings back to 45 degrees which means tanks had to be jettisoned on every mission so that was a huge drawback of that aircraft so the usually in, in peacetime training and just managed with the ventral tank and uh, the, i think uh, the iaf procured a large number of 800 liter tanks just to meet the operation requirement the otherwise the aircraft was uh, extremely powerful it had a 11 11.5 kiloton engine the R-29B, which was um, later on manufactured under license at uh, Korapak. The uh, MF version, which uh, Ramusa flew, was uh, an interceptor. So the main emphasis was on the kind of radar it had and the kind of missiles it could carry and so on. But uh, bo both these airplanes saw service in the IAF. Mm. Now, um, during your uh, test flight, you had this chase plane and you pulled a little fast one on the chase pilot. Tell us about that. Yes, sir. the uh, one of the requirements was to check out the navigation system. So it had a Doppler, Doppler and uh, twin gyro platform kind of a system. So I said, I want to do a triangle cross country. So they said, okay, well, I did a 300 kilometer triangle across country. And uh, without telling me, they sent a chase guy to make sure that I didn't stray from my nav route. Mm -hmm. So as I was heading to the first turning point, I found an aircraft in my rear view mirror. So instead of turning the shortest way around to the next waypoint, I did the longer way turn around and I crossed this guy head on. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I came back and the last uh, leg guy said, I must sweep the wings back to full 72 degrees and go to the maximum mm -hmm. indicated airspeed allowed. And uh, it, it, with the wings swept back, the MiG-23 was like an arrowhead. Mm. Very, very sleek and uh, Roll stability was very poor. You had to have the damper on, otherwise the wing would keep on rocking all the time. Oh wow! Uh -huh. Yeah. So that and that was a um, great experience, and uh, the aircraft did serve in the IA for about almost 25, 28 years. The PN. Then uh, in 79, I, as I came back to Adampur after this Russian trip, uh, the, my squadron was moved to Batinda. And Batinda was a forward base sub support unit. It had no infrastructure. The ATC was a makeshift uh, construction. There was no fuel because the fuel had to come all the way from a place called Mulanpur on the Diana Moga Highway. And uh, it was a difficult time for the squadron because we could do very little flying. 
and I couldn't even do night flying there, so I had to operate detachments at Adampur to do night flying training. And uh, finally, after I handed over the squadron in 1980, uh, Jan, the squadron was moved back to Adampur. But I had the rough end of the stick at uh, Batinda, but um, we coped. Uh, then I came back to AST, and this time I was the only wing commander in AST in 1980. And I was looking after both the school and the flight escort. And I ran uh, number three experimental test pilots course, which fortunately had only three. Yeah. It had only three pilots on the course, three fixed wing pilots. One of them was an Iraqi pilot, uh, Major Hussein. And uh, so after finishing that course in uh, the following year, I went off to Iraq for two years. Right. Now, I don't recall you having done FIS. So. No, I never did. You did do FIS. FIS? You never did FIS. No. Okay, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing, in, during my various tenures in the school, I was uh, cleared to instruct on uh, six different types of aircraft. Uh -huh, that okay. is, uh, Kiran, the MiG 21, the Marut trainer, the Canberra trainer, the Avro, and the Hunter. Hunter trainer. Six. Uh, I will show you a snapshot of the certificate in my logbook also. Then uh, in Iraq, I went to Iraq in uh, end of 81. And uh, the Iraq tenure, there are three things which stand out. One is that um, the Iraqi cadets we were supposed to train. I was in 27 squadron Iraqi Air Force, which was the MiG-21 OCU. And the cadets who were coming to us, they had done uh, L-39 flying, and but their English was very poor. So a lot of time was being wasted in briefing and debriefing. Then we got a batch of students who had done two years of their flying training in France. So I found that their French was much better than their English, so I started instructing them in French. So this was an Indian instructor teaching an Iraqi cadet to fly a Russian aircraft in French. <laughs> that was, <laughs> so that was globalization long before the word became popular. And had the war broken out by then? Yes, yes. The war had broken out in September 80 and we went there in October hmm. 81. Okay. So what was it like with a, you know, doing training them on, you know, MiG-21, but during, uh, during a war? Yeah, they were all uh, being sent off to operational squadrons wherever they deployed in the south of Iraq. So there was a great um, amount of pressure to push these courses through. Uh, and uh, so one was this instructing in French. The second was... Uh, during my second year there, one day I was doing a section takeoff with an Iraqi, teaching him to do a formation takeoff. I was number two. And when the leader put over the afterburner, my aircraft just shot forward like a arrow. I said, what are you doing? He says, sir, I can't move the throttle back. Huh. So I held the throttle and I tried it was locked solid. You know? Oh, bloody hell. So I quickly put off the afterburner using the circuit breaker and climbed to seven or eight kilometers in dry power, put out the dive brake, set up an orbit, and the speed stabilized at uh, 750 kilometers an hour, which is uh, manageable speed. And I was orbiting all the time and I was telling the cadet, keep tugging at the throttle, keep tugging at the throttle. And then after about uh, 10 minutes of both of us hauling the throttle in, the small amount of play developed. So we kept rocking it to and fro, to and fro, to and fro. Then suddenly the jerk, it came back to 85% and got stuck. Mm. Oh, boy. <laughs> then I, of course, I had declared an emergency. I told the base what was happening. And uh, I said, now my throttle is 85%. I'm going to come back and attempt a landing because I knew in trials carried out at AST, it was possible to land an aircraft with the throttle stuck at 85%. Uh, 
and uh, so I came in and uh, burnt up fuel to about 400 meters, came down, told the crash crew and everybody to be waiting for me at the side of the runway and uh, ground crew with chocks because I couldn't switch off the engine so the hot brakes would start feeding. So as I touched on, I saw all these crash vehicles uh, charging on the side of the runway. Brought, and after I touched on, I told the Iraqi cadet, pull, and both of us hauled the throttle back with all our might. And, uh, it came back to the blown flap gate. Okay. <laughs> so I uh, was able to bring the aircraft to a stop, and they quickly put the chocks on the wheel. But it took another. 15 to 20 minutes for the airman to disconnect the fuel lines and for the engine to wind, wind down. Wow. Oh boy. Wow. And uh, this was on a cold February morning in Tikrit. And uh, when I got out of the aircraft, my overall was absolutely drenched in sweat. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh. That was one. Then the next uh, interesting thing that happened was um, towards July 1973, we were ordered to move to a base, different base called H2. Now there's an oil pipeline running from the Kirkuk oil fields to Haifa and present day Israel. And they have these pumping stations called H1, H2, H3 built by the British. And each of these pumping stations has a small airfield for air maintenance. Aha, okay. So those strips were developed into full-fledged bases by the Iraqis. So we moved to a base called H2 towards the Jordan border. And a couple of days after landing there, the base commander sent for me. So I went and he said, oh, I hear you are a test pilot. I said, yes. He said, you please come with me. Then he took me to the hangar where there were a lot of crates of woven bamboo, uh, what they call uh, bamboo screens you see in South India made out of uh, woven. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Crates made out of that with the bitumen lining inside for waterproofing. And inside were um, these Chinese MiG-27, MiG-27 F7s made by in Chengdu in China. And they're come in these crates and there were Chinese guys in the hangar erecting these aircraft. You know, the fuselage, the wings, the tailplane, they were all separate. They were all being put together. He says, these aircraft have come from China. Will you do the air test on them? Wow. I said, sure. <laughs> Show me the manual. <laughs> he showed me the manual. They were all in Mandarin. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and it was uh, it was slightly different from the MiGs we were flying because it had a canopy which was hinged at the back. It had two internal guns. It had a different ejection seat. Uh, so I said, "Let me sit in the cockpit." He said, "So okay, you go and sit in the cockpit on one of the erected aircraft." I went and sat inside and found that all the cockpit inscriptions were in Mandarin again. But the cockpit was an identical replica of the F-13 cockpit which we were flying in Iraq. Uh -huh. okay. So I asked for a hydraulic trolley and a battery to be connected. Then I checked out the functionality of all the switches and uh, looked at the engine manual, noted down the jet pipe temperature limits, the RPM limits, oil pressure limits. Those you could make out because those were figures. And uh, armed with this information, I said, um, I'm ready to go. So the base commander said, go. And so I sat and fired the engine and took off. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, the aircraft handled very well. It was, uh, I was quite impressed by the Chinese ability to reverse engineer an aircraft like that. And, uh, then I came back, I did uh, 
at a, at a six former airplanes than all the other Indian instructors. I briefed them, then everybody got into the act. But the Iraqi cadets were never allowed to fly these um, aircraft. Only the instructors flew it as long as we were there. Now, these cadets, were you teaching them uh, combat or were you just teaching them, you know, basically how to fly the MiG-21? No, we, we taught them uh, the basics of air combat, like uh, tail chase, 1v1, 2v2, and uh, also air to ground weapon delivery, uh, front guns, rockets, and bombs. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So we... Were there instructors from other countries? Um... Oh, no. When we first went, there was a, a Pakistani Air Force officer, um, Commander Cecil Chowdhury was with us in the same squadron. We flew together. We were great friends. And uh, Cecil Chaudhary was a much decorated officer who had participated in both the uh, 65 and 71 wars. Very interesting. But uh, because he was a Christian, he wasn't uh, destined to go very high up. So he left as a group captain and I think he spent his uh, the last portion of his career in Abu Dhabi or one of the Emirate countries. Oh. But, but he, was, uh, he was he was a good flyer and uh, very, very gregarious and social guy. He would visit all of us in our homes in the evening. But Diwali, he said, come on, come on, let's play Teen Pati. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, nice. it was nice. <laughs> Did you speak about your Sargoda raid with him? <laughs> uh, no, no, didn't. <laughs> okay. we, we left the two wars out of our conversation. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Yeah. So I came back to AST and uh, this time in 1984, I was promoted to group captain and I became uh, uh, the chief test pilot. But before that, in early 84, I, uh, your father was the commandant. He detailed me to carry out the 32 induction trials. Mm -hmm. ah, okay. So I went up to Delhi and met the Russian team, did a conversion onto the N32 with them and then we went and did all the landings in the forward areas like uh, Machuka, Tooting, Wallon. Wow, fascinating. And then we tell me about those, tell me about those flights. Uh, the uh, Machuka and Tooting were okay. The, the you know PSP sheets were there on those. Uh, How long was it? Three thousand feet? Uh, no, no. They they were about um, Six to between six and eight hundred yards long, but uh, the N32 could easily hack it. And uh, the earlier, when the N32 had come earlier in 1976, uh, AVM Lamba had done the evaluation and he had pointed out a number of flaws. One of them was uh, stalling behavior, the wing used to drop badly during the stall. So I had to check those things out, and uh, they had cured all of that. But the real uh, crazy landing we did was at Wolong. You know, Wolong uh, as a runway which is roughly uh, north-south, you know, two 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 zero kind of a thing, zero two zero two zero kind of thing. And uh, it is on the west bank of the Lohit River. Right. So the caribous and the otters and all used to land facing the northeast and take off facing the southeast. There was a big hill at the end of the runway and then duck down into the valley and come away. Wow. Mm -hmm. This was not possible to do in the N32. So the Russian test pilot Kurlin and I, we went, we did a number of approaches on both sides. And Kurlin said, I will land facing southwest that is on uh, 20 or 22 and take off the other way wow into the hill yeah so one fine morning we got airborne from uh, in march of 1984 we got airborne from jorat with only 
four people in the aircraft. One was uh, Kurlin uh, Vinkuman, the Ghosh who had done the N32 conversion in uh, Russia and come back. He was uh, part of my team. And uh, Kurlin said, I want him on the right seat. I said, fair enough, because he is more experienced. And I sat in the jump seat and there was a navigator. And we took uh, just enough fuel to go there and come back. So the aircraft was light. Right, OK. So Kurlin came down from the northwest along the Lohit River, did a sharp turn to the right and lined up with the runway and landed. And before landing, about at height of about three or four feet, he unlocked the props. So there's huge disking drag and the aircraft landed with a hell of a thump. And uh, he brought the aircraft to a stop, turned it around. Now we are going to be taking off downwind. And the Kurlin said, no, no, I'm going to switch off. I'll get out. I want to see this place. So there was a small Gorkha regiment there. And the Gorkha regiment guys presented Kurlin with a kukri. Uh -huh. <laughs> now I was least interested in all these uh, festivities because I was looking at the windsock because the wind was picking up and the tailwind was increasing. We would be taking off downwind. So finally, we lined up at the very end of the runway with the hill at the back and took off facing northeast. And soon after getting airborne, there was a big uh, mountainside. You know, it looks close, but it was about a kilometer away, a kilometer or more. So we rolled, and we got airborne. Uh, for two reasons. One, as the runway was finishing, Kurlin dropped. He increased flat from 15 to 30 degrees. And then the runway finished. So we were airborne. And uh, we... Now uh, this cliff was, or this mountain face was, we were heading towards it when Kurlin put on a uh, bank to turn to the left to climb away along the river. Along the river, right. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting there looking at this aircraft literally hanging in the air, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but Kurlin was a master, master craftsman, you know, the way he handled that aircraft, the way he performed the takeoff, the way he knew his aircraft was uh, really an eye opener. So he came back and landed safely at. Uh, Jorhat, and in the report I said the N32 is not fit for operations from along. This was in 1984. I don't know if things have changed now, but uh, right, right, wow, that was amazing. It. <laughs> then uh, when I became the CTP in uh, 19, what is it, uh, 84 October, I became a group captain, and the first thing I did was go and do a Jaguar conversion at Ambala, and I got involved with the Jaguar Darren program. And uh, the whole of 85 went in this Darren program. Then I was also always very enamored of the team concept, which I learned at EPNA. I said, we must also follow the team concept in India and have a pilot engineer team. Right. So I conducted two ad hoc flight test engineers courses at uh, mm -hmm. ASD and uh, about I think half a dozen officers became trained as flight test engineers. Wow. But uh, when um, at AVM day when he became commandant in 85 sometime he says no this ad hoc course is all very well but we shouldn't make it and the government should authorize it and we must have proper establishment mm. and we must have proper facilities. So he mm. stopped running it after two courses and then a long battle with MOD ensued and finally we managed to run the courses from I think 1991 mm. onwards, proper courses. Wow. Uh -huh. okay. But uh, this was a direct result of uh, my FNA training. Mm. Right, right, right. Right. In 86 April, 
I was part of the team which went to France and UK to evaluate the advanced jet trainer. And the IAF was looking for the advanced jet trainer and the two candidate aircraft were the Alpha Jet in France and the Hawk in the UK. Yeah, so Air Commodore Jayal was the leader of the team and um, it was a fairly big team but I was one of the test pilots and it's coordinated a PR Sharma was with me. Hmm. And up until that point for advanced jet training, we were we didn't have anything. Um, you couldn't describe an Iskra or a Karen Mark II as an advanced jet trainer, I guess. Yeah. The, those two aircraft didn't meet our requirements. So this was basically uh, a new air staff requirement that had been put out. Um, so we went to France and we flew the Alpha Jet. And um, the flying was carried out at a place called uh, Back to Eastridge, you know, my old haunt, Eastridge. So one of the first things I did when I went there, I went and paid a visit to the school. Um, so it had completely changed the facilities that improved their move to new premises. And uh, anyway, they were happy to see an old graduate over there. Uh, then the alpha what jet, was the alpha jet like so what alpha was jet like was a very good trainer very good performance and the main characteristic was uh, spinning it could perform four types of spins a normal spin an oscillatory spin a flat spin and an inverted spin wow and all you could enter each of these with just by varying the inputs at entry you know, the way you move the stick Forward or applied aileron. Uh, and uh, it took some getting used to to get these entry conditions right to make. But the French test pilot Patrick Experton, whom I was flying with, he uh, demonstrated these four spins. And the surprising thing was that the recovery action for all of them was just release controls. No, the canopy, it was a clamshell canopy and uh, to lift it, you had two handles on the cockpit rim. So, those are called spin recovery handles because <laughs> you just you, hold the two. You just let go the control column and held those two handles and the aircraft recovered by itself. It was amazing. So, I was so impressed by this. I said, Patrick, um, I need to do one more sortie of this. So off we went, uh, we climbed to 40,000 feet over the Mediterranean. Nice, lovely day it was. And we, I don't know how many spins we did, but uh, the flat spin was great because the spin axis passes behind the cockpit and you get thrown forward. Forward, oh and, wow. <laughs> and, and your nose is going along the horizon, you know, rotating on the horizon. And the rate of rotation was fairly fast. Then uh, the inverted spin, of course, I'd never experienced. So he showed it to me a couple of times and I did one. And uh, it's it's quite a it's quite easy to make out an inverted spin once you know the differences. Then we came back to land and Patrick said, um, I'll show you a vertical overshoot. I said, what is a vertical overshoot? He, he overshot open full power, or he was sitting at the back. He overshot, raised the undercarriage and did a loop. Hmm. He did wow. a loop. And over on the when in the inverted position, he stayed for a while so that he got the right spacing. And uh, throttle back, put the dive brakes out, put the undercarriage down, and came and landed off that. Holy cow! <laughs> <laughs> Then he said, the he said, now you try it. So I said, great. <laughs> so I did the same thing and uh, I've never ever done it before or since a vertical overshoot. Wow. But uh, it was great fun. <laughs> you know, you see it being done by the Rafale in their uh, demo nowadays where they come, they do, uh, the, they climb, do a half roll and then pull dive brakes under carriage and then touch down on the runway. It's quite a yeah. quite an amazing maneuver. <laughs> yes. 
this this was i was absolutely blown off by this uh, particular issue anyway i i personally was a bit uh, sad that we didn't choose the alpha jet because it was a wonderful trainer anyway from there we went to uh, the uk and we flew the hawk and after the spinning experience on the alpha jet the hawk spin was very 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 said it but the hawk had much better visibility from the instructor seat at the back and also the engine in the hawk was already um, it was the dry version of the 811 engine which was being made at hl bangalore mm, for the jaguar and, and uh, yeah the 811 engine jaguar this is the hawk had the unreheated unreheat, engine so there was a great deal of commonality and i think on techno economic grounds they chose the hawk so is there anything else we looked at did we ever look at the l39 albatross or uh, no then this evaluation we only did uh, these mm. two and we didn't look at the um, any of the, the italian marches or for that requirement um uh, mm -hmm. okay super so you went on to station command after that is it uh, yes before that um, um yeah i from once i finished my ctb tenure i went to gorakhpur as the aoc but before that in uh, late 87 yeah, i was specially nominated by vayu bhavan to do the first self protection jammer trials on the jaguar uh -huh. this was the first big ew electronic warfare equipment that we acquired from israel of course those days there was no uh, we didn't even have diplomatic relation with israel and the whole thing very hush hush and hush hush ah, ah, ah. so i did the initial trials so this was an external pod and just an external pod was carried on the ventral yeah. station it was called the dawn pod and uh, the <clears throat> two squadrons in uh, gorakhpur were supposed to be equipped with that so i had to go to gorakhpur and set up the dawn servicing facilities and induct this equipment into service and so on so that was and this would operate by itself, so it would detect, um, you know, hostile radar signals, jam them, do all those things by itself, or yeah, was it pilot controlled? The pilot had very little control over it, but uh, the main thing was you needed good intelligence. You needed to know the frequencies of the radars and certain other parameters like the pulse width and the pulse repetition frequency and so on. So it had uh, some standard techniques in it, like a range gate pull off. You know, it it you fire the return pulse with a fractional delay hmm. of a nanosecond or two, and uh, that will give the wrong range and the miss distance. You know, if, if the missile misses you by say 10, 15 meters, or I mean 20 meters, it, you're probably going to get away with it. Right, right, so, right, right. So that was the self protection jammer trials. Uh, and then uh, in Gorakhpur, there was a lot of admin work. You know, there I, I didn't do much flying, even though I was Jaguar qualified, I didn't do much flying, but I did manage to do a Mi 8 conversion on the helicopter unit. That in fact, I ended up flying about 30 40 hours on the me it where i flew very little on the back <laughs> okay uh, well so from there i went to rcds in 1990 and uh, there the big thing was uh, we were students from 28 nations. We were 40 Brits and 40 foreigners, foreigners from 28 countries. And uh, there I met up with uh, Brigadier Parvez Musharraf, who later became oh, wow. <laughs> president of Pakistan. Oh. And the Air Force officer was one Air Commodore Ali Udin. Again, we were friends. And uh, 
later on in um, 2005, we had a reunion and I was able to visit uh, Parvez in Pakistan when he was president. So, but that's a different story. <laughs> yeah, um, just for the audience, um, what is RCDS? And I think if you can just explain the the three-tier uh, education system of the armed forces, the NDA, staff college, and then NDC level uh, courses. Yeah. You, you see, the um, three tri-service organizations in the Indian Armed Forces are the National Defense Academy, where cadets come, and all three are trained together for three years. Then the next time they meet up is around 10 to 11 years of service at the Defense Services Staff College at Wellington, where you learn about each other's service and uh, you learn how to write uh, appreciations and conduct uh, exercises, sand model exercises and so on. Uh, the third one is that the, at the Colonel Brigadier level, we have the National Defense College in Delhi. So every year, some people from the UK Armed Forces come here and one or two Indians are sent to the UK. And there it is called the Royal College of Defense Studies. And uh, it is an international course, a lot of country studies, um, a lot of tours. Uh, tours, we went and visited NATO countries, uh, NATO bases in Europe. Then we had a world tour. I went to South America, uh, visited uh, Venezuela, Mexico, Chile, and Argentina. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> The interesting thing in Argentina was we were the first British uh, delegation to go there after the Falklands War. Oh, wow. This was sort of to break the diplomatic frost, the frosty ties which were existing after the war. But the Argentinian Air Force guys refused to meet us because the Argentinian Air Force had almost stopped the invasion, you know, they sank five ships and they had put bombs in the insides of five more ships, but the bombs didn't go off because they were dropped too low for the fuses to arm. Oh, and uh, Admiral Sandy Woodford, Woodford, the Woodward, the task force commander, he said if those five bombs had gone off, I would have had no choice but to withdraw. So that was a very close call. And uh, otherwise, the World Tour was a great experience meeting all the Latin American uh, armed forces. And, uh, this, is, uh, this is the time in your career where you, know, you're, you begin to appreciate how the armed forces fit into broader national security policy, and diplomacy, and things like that. Right? Yes, yes, exactly. And uh, it, it was again a um, very, very big uh, learning experience. So I, I must thank the Indian Air Force for giving me all these learning experiences, starting with the Air Force Academy, then the junior commander's course, the staff college, the test pilot's course, the fighter combat leader's course, the RCPS. This is a huge lifelong learning, you know. So. And uh, so that was that. I came back and uh, I took over the command of AST from ABM Lamba, who superannuated. And uh, during my tenure at, uh, as commandant, two things happened. One was the AN-32 re-engineering. Uh, uh -huh, right. We re-engined the one AN-32 with AN-12 engines. Yes, Grupi Akta has spoken about that in his episode. And yeah. uh, we did a number of engine failures at uh, rotation, uh, 13 of them, and uh, wrote out the operations manual. And uh, so that was very interesting. Then uh, in towards the end of my two-year tenure as commandant, I was sent to Israel to evaluate the Israeli offer of the MiG-21 upgrade. Ah, right, right, right. So in May of uh, 1993, I went to Israel, which again was very hush-hush because we had just started diplomatic relations. 
So I had to flew, fly from Delhi to Frankfurt via Lufthansa. And fly Frankfurt, Tel Aviv by Lufthansa again. And on the return trip, I had to go British Airways, uh, Tel Aviv to London and London, Delhi by Air India. All sorts of funny things. Uh, anyway, I flew the Lavi which was supposed to have, uh, I was supposed to be evaluating the radar which was being offered. But unfortunately, as soon as we took off within 10 minutes, the radar packed up. And uh, so for the rest of the time, the Israeli pilot uh, was the chief pilot of the Israel Aircraft Industries. He said, I will show you Israel. So <laughs> we went a little further north, we saw the Golan Heights, and then we turned right and saw the Sea of Galilee, a little further south, went to the Negev Desert. And then finally, uh, we still had some more fuel and time. We came and did aerobatics over the Gaza Strip and landed. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. Then, so what, what was your experience like flying the, the Lavi? What was that aircraft like? Oh, Lavi was a beautiful aircraft. The flight controls. The power it had and uh, the avionics it had, it had a glass cockpit and it, it was a very fine aircraft. And I think the Chinese J-10 is modeled quite a lot on the Lavi. The, the, uh, so I came back and the other thing I asked the Israelis was, uh, listen, we want to have a life extension of the airframe of the MiG Biz. Because without the airframe life extension, we won't be able to exploit the aircraft. So I said, do you have the structural data to do this work? They said, no, we expect you to give it to us. So uh, I knew we didn't have it. I knew that our uh, structural test program was underway at NAIR. So I came back and I put these two things in the report that the radar could not be evaluated and the structural data is not available with the Israelis. I guess that's why we decided finally to go with the MIG proposal for... Yeah, then there was a, there was a school of thought in Vayubhavan in, in the plans branch. You know, I was DSR that time in the plans branch that uh, we could buy various bits and pieces of best equipment in the world and put it together and integrate it on the aircraft. I said, hold your horses. This is not easy because I was involved in the Darren program. I knew how difficult and how time consuming it is to integrate various pieces of equipment. I said, it is better to go with the Mikoyan Design Bureau offer because they are the manufacturers and they know best. Mm -hmm. So I, I led two teams to Moscow in uh, December 93 and July of 94 to finalize the tech specs of the upgrade. And uh, that was again visiting all the Russian firms and firming up the upgrade was a um, good experience. And we went landed up in Moscow in the month of December and you know what the Russian winter is like. so. That was bitterly cold and uh, the Russian Soviet Union had broken up and the new Russian Federation had come and things were in a real mess. The people were standing on roadsides and selling off their possessions. The country was in a real bad shape. And uh, the Mikoyan Design Bureau people apologized to the chief designer, Mr. Belyukov, apologized to us and he said, listen, I don't have the money even to take you all out for a good lunch or a good dinner. So that was the state of affairs then. Wow. And you'd seen it in its glory days in the mid 70s. Yeah, I'd seen it in uh, the height of the Soviet era when it was, Moscow was the safest city in the world. But now things had changed. We were cautioned not to go out on our own because you're likely to be mugged all that. So I said we must go to the Mikoyan offer because they would be the best people to integrate whatever equipment we choose. 
So that's what eventually happened. There was also that Romanian upgrade, the land survey. Did we ever look at that? No, that was uh, that was the experience which the Israel aircraft industry was planning to use for our upgrade. Ah, oh, okay, 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 okay. Uh, the Romanian Lancer was done entirely by Israel. So then um, this was the Mikoyan upgrade uh, thing. The other thing which I did when I was DSR, uh, the LCA program also was, fell into my lap how to monitor the LCA program and so on. And I knew that the control law team, a national control law team had been established and a national wing team had been established, uh, drawing the expertise from several organizations to achieve a particular objective. So I said, even for flight testing, I was convinced that we needed the uh, a small group of people needed to look full time at the LCA program. Well, folks, uh, I think we're going to take a stop here. We've spent an hour and a half with M. Ashil Rajkumar just listening to his fascinating experiences as a test pilot and somebody who was involved with a significant portion of the selection of new uh, aircraft for the Indian Air Force. Uh, my interview continued with him, where we began to speak about his involvement with the LCA. Uh, is going on to set up the National Flight Test Center. That interview will be released next week as the first interview as part of a series of interviews with test pilots and flight test engineers that were involved with the LCA program. That will go on for pretty much all of January and maybe some of February. In the meantime, sign up for updates at blueskiespodcast.com. There you'll find links to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. You can also write to us with your comments, questions, suggestions and feedback from the website or to blueskies at prganapati.com. Subscribe to the podcast on any podcasting platform such as Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts and even on YouTube. If you like what you heard, share it with your friends, give us a rating in your favorite podcasting app and write us a review. It will help other people find us. I want to give my thanks to Saurav Chaudhia for our logo and Prithvik for the music. I want to reiterate that all the views expressed here are personal and this podcast has not been approved by or reviewed by the Air Force, Ministry of Defense or any branch of the government. In the meantime, stay safe and Jai Hind.